Okay, apologies for the long name of this video. I just couldn't think of a better title or a shorter one. But what I propose to do in this video is to show you why I think Great Campaigns of the American Civil War is one of the best simulations out there on Civil War campaigns. Now, for those of you who don't own any of the titles in the series, uh, keep in mind that that these are uh, campaign games on the operational scale. So don't be fooled by thinking, well, I'll get Roads to Gettysburg 2, and I'll have a great Battle of Antietam game, a Battle of Gettysburg game, and the Battle of the Monocacy. These are not battle games. They are full campaigns at the operational level. So what I propose to do in this video, and I don't know how long it'll be, it shouldn't be too long, I want to show why these are some of the best simulations on the market of Civil War campaigns. And I propose to do that by sh comparing two games. Uh, Grant Takes Command, which is about the Overland Campaign in 64, and the Old Wilderness Campaign by SPI. Now, to be fair, we have to keep in mind that Wilderness Campaign was designed in 1973, and uh, the first title in this series came out in uh, 1993. So this series is, you know, designed 21 years later. So are we comparing apples and oranges? Not really, and I'm going to try to show you why. Now, let's get one thing straight. I am not taking a backhanded slap at Wilderness Campaign. I love Wilderness Campaign. I think it's a great game, and for 1972, it was way ahead of its time. But the MMP series, The Great Campaigns, is a horse of a different color, and I think it's a superior simulation to all other Civil War games. Let's uh, see why. Now, for the purposes of the video, I'm going to use the map from Stonewall Jackson's Way 2, The Battles of Bull Run, and we'll be looking at the map to Wilderness Campaign, of course. Why am I using this map instead of the Grant Takes Command map? Well, the Grant Takes Command map has not been upgraded uh, yet. As you veterans probably know, most of these games are being redone now with absolutely fabulous maps. And uh, let's start with the turn record first. Now in strategic games and operational games, the time scale is quite important. And in Wilderness Campaign, each turn represented two days. You can see the 64 campaign begins and it covers May 3rd and 4th. Turn 2 would be May 5th and 6th and so on. Each turn representing two days. But in the Great Campaigns series, each turn represents a single day. So we must keep that in mind when we're comparing the two. They're very similar, but one day as opposed to two can make some differences, especially as to marching times and distances. Another important difference is the scale of the units. Here in Wilderness Campaign, Warren's fifth corps is represented by a single counter, corps level. While in the Great Campaign series, Warren's corps is represented by its component divisions, with information that is not a factor in the SPI one. And, of course, you get Warren himself as a leader. The other important difference here, of course, is the scale of the maps. Now, here we're showing the 5th Corps at Culpeper Courthouse. Each hex on this scale represents about 4 miles. So, in two days, if the 5th Corps followed the track, he would do something like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. He about, would be about at Gordonsville in two days. Let's look at the same move in the Great Campaign series. Now for this example I've not bothered putting the strength counters underneath the divisions. I'm just trying to show you the same move done in the Great Campaign series. It's quite different. Now I'm not going to try to teach the whole system again, but for those of you who know it, you should have no trouble following it. In this case we're going to activate Warren who's going to be able to activate the three divisions underneath him. And on this scale, with one mile to the hex, that's what's so nice about it, 
core goes two hexes, you know it's gone two miles. You're going to roll individually for every single division. And there are costs to stack depending on the uh, terrain. So, the movement is variable. You're going to look on a chart. And in this case, Warren will be adding two of the dice. And let's see how far his first division moves. Now this is where the game really shines as a simulation. Warren's going to roll the die. And since he's a infantry leader, he's going to be able to add one to the die. And that's the number of movement points the top division gets. So in this case, got a very good roll. He's actually got seven movement points. So you take Robinson's division, and we'll do the same move as we did in the Wilderness Campaign. He'll move straight down the track. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Fine. And here's where the game really shines. He also is awarded a fatigue marker. You just can't move free in this game. Every single move causes fatigue. And each division must roll separately. Oh, pardon me, that was a, a core activation. So they all have seven movement points. So Wadsworth will go one, two, three, four, five, six. He will not have enough movement points left to stack with that because, again, accounting for the traffic jams, they've done a very good job in this game. When you stack between 3 to 11 or more than 11, you pay more for the hex depending on the terrain. So, in a very effective way, it shows how Civil War divisions and corps actually marched. And Griffin would go down there. I don't think he'd have enough to stack. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, he would. So he can be here, but he also has a fatigue marker. And Warren can be with any division he chooses. So you can see the huge difference between the two systems, where in one, the Corps simply moved down to Gordonsville with no fatigue at all. He's going to be able to move six every single turn, that's every two days, infinitely. No fatigue, no repercussions. On this one, they're already accumulating fatigue. It's a superior way of showing the way Corps, divisions actually marched. And you can see the traffic jams that can occur. But to further illustrate my point, Let's go for another turn, compare the two. Using our fifth core example again, the fifth core desires to move down the track, and he just does so. Go six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, no punishment for fatigue, and he will be able to do that turn every single turn, as long as he's in command. Let's go over to Warren, and let's activate him again. Activating Warren, Aha! Uh -huh. This time the shoe's on the other foot. He gets only one movement point. Actually two, because he's adding one. So, this is a whole horse of a different color. Warren stays there for the moment. Robinson will go two, and then he gets two fatigue. And since it was a core activation, all of these guys only have two movement points. So, Griffin goes here, and has to fatigue and the third division won't be able to stack and he's got two fatigue. Warren can be with any division he wishes. So you see the big differences in the game. This unit, the core level, moving every two days, is moving completely free. And that's the old style of war games done in the 60s, 70s, and I dare say many games still do that today. Units just march forever with no repercussions for fatiguing the soldiers. Let's go another turn or so uh, with the new system. I won't bother to show this uh, division again, because as you know, he'll be able to move free every single turn. Let's go for a third turn with Warren, see what he can do. Okay, he rolls the die. This time he gets a four, which becomes a five. Now here's the danger level. Sure, you can go five movement points, one, two, three, four, five. And he will be fatigue three. But when you roll and achieve a fatigue three result, you have to roll again to see if you're going to get the penalty for an extended march. So you roll, 
and he gets a 6, and that is not good. That's a D result, which means his organization marker would be turned upside down. Those are normally under each counter. You see it's organized. He would become disorganized. Put that underneath. And now you can see the penalty. He's fatigued three, and he's disorganized. And these fellows do the same thing. They can march, but they have to roll individually for extended march. Griffin would roll for extended march. He gets a 6-2. Again, not very good. So we take his organized marker, flip him to disorganized, and put it underneath. And we'll put uh, Warren with him. Well, let's see how this fella does. Wadsworth. Oh, he's on the wrong side. Wadsworth. Put a fatigue marker on him. Roll for extended march. And finally, he does not get disorganized. So his organization march, uh, marker would stay intact underneath him. So already in this game, you can see the superior method it's using to show the marching of soldiers. Soldiers get tired. They can get exhausted. They can get disorganized. Now, I won't follow any more, but the logical, logical extension of all this marching is eventually you go to fatigue four, or you have to stop. And next turn, you get to remove some of these fatigue markers. So that's one of the big differences between the Great Campaigns system and every other Civil War operational system. Okay, well that's all I need to show in the video. I think I've addressed the query about the title. That's why I think the Great Campaigns of the American Civil War is the best system for simulating Civil War campaigns. Now, don't think that you can just take the Civil War system and just retrofit it to all your old Civil War games. These games were designed at a different time, different audience, different level of complexity, and they are fine games in themselves. Like, make no mistake, I really like the Wilderness Campaign. And if I, I, I want to play a quicker moving uh, game on the Wilderness Campaign, this would be the one to play. But if you want to simulate Civil War campaigns and battles, I don't think you can do any better than playing Great Campaigns of the American Civil War, currently published by MMP, Multi-Man Publishing. So that's it for today, and uh, thank you for watching.